Well, good morning. Welcome to a cold South School room. But uh, let's have a word of prayer. Our Lord, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath day that we may set aside the cares and stress of the world around us. That we may come together to meet with you and to fellowship with our friends and family. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit be here as we discuss your word and this lesson, that you'll guide our, our thoughts and our words, that we may gain understanding and wisdom that you will give us. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have a new quarter. It's on education. should be interesting. Our memory text comes from Job. Behold, God is exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? Can imagine God as a teacher. Have ever had a teacher that you really looked up to and admired? Usually, in the course of our lives, we have a, you know, we have a grade school teacher, a high school teacher that really impressed us, touched our, our, our being, and uh, respected quite a bit. Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. What is Genesis chapter 2 about? Pardon? Creation of man and woman. Creation of man and woman. Garden of Eden. Let's go down to verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. There he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, there was a tree of life, and a tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, if God created a beautiful earth, why the special garden? Wasn't there a whole world to take care of? At that time, there was just a garden that they were doing. There was other, there, yeah, there was other outside, but they were put right in the garden of the world. Wasn't the rest of the creation beautiful? I'm sure it was all, but that's what God placed them. That's what God wanted them to do take care of the garden that he had created for Something special, something different than the rest of creation. We named creation being a perfect in all ways. And then he makes this garden being, which is special, even more than the rest of creation. Let's go down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So, why did, what did God tell man to do? But y'all said, you know, what was it supposed to do to eat? Tend the trees. Yeah, work it and take care of it. Y'all thought, if creation was perfect, what could Adam add to it? To work it and take care of it. You ever had a garden or thought of it to a garden? Well, it is today. 
I sure wasn't that one created. Yeah. It makes you wonder what what do we mean by worker? Because there's no weeds or thorns to pull out. But he said, work it and take care of it. So he had some type of work for Adam to do that. We probably you know, can't imagine too much. Go back to chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind our image, in our likeness, so they, were, they, were, they rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So the original purpose of mankind was to rule over the earth. God gave himself rule over the fish, over the birds, the livestock, and the wild animals. And then also in the garden Eden to tend and take care of it. How is this, this teaching? If you look at this as teaching, how is putting Adam in the garden a teaching exercise? Uh, when you do, when you tend your garden, you learn, if you tend animals, you learn from those animals. Okay. So, God was teaching man to learn from the nature. What is he supposed to learn? What was man supposed to learn from ruling over fish and birds and livestock and wild animals, tending and taking care of the garden. What was he supposed to learn? Knowledge and understanding. A lot of what, Maisie? Knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding of what? Of the perfectness of God's creation. The purpose of his creation? Yeah. Which God's is what? Because he created all those animals, he created everything in the world. And that is why he put Adam in the, in the garden to put them names. And that they, they put them in one. So, animals have to take care of things, yes. name animals. Yes. And learn wisdom and knowledge about what? What is that God created there? What, what he did not do that, you know? He, he was, he was, he, he, he wanted a, he wanted a mate, you know? So he was kind of worried about knowing that he has to give these animals their dearity. And he does not have a mate for himself, you know? Okay. Did that jump ahead? He's looking for a mate or helper. But by having Adam tend the garden, by ruling over all these animals and fishes and birds, what was God trying to get Adam to understand? Obedience. Obedience. Adam, Adam was only one day old. He had, he was all new. The only he thing he had was yeah. common sense to learn anything from him to God. I mean, he was a full-grown man, yeah, but he was only one or two days old at the time. But God wanted him to learn trust and obedience mm -hmm. um, of what God had told him to do. And that's what we are supposed to learn today, to trust and obey God. Don't you think that by having Adam tend to this garden and rule over everything God made, that is trying to show Adam God's love, that God had made all these things, our love for mankind, that he, by tending the trees, flowers, and all that stuff, that he see through nature, God's love. And isn't that a class in itself? <clears throat> Understanding how trees grow, plants grow, how animals are different from each other. So I think it was a, a learning ground 
because like in school we do the experiments, you learn from that experiment, exper uh, experiment how things work. And I think God gave Adam these duties that he could learn how the world works. And he could learn God made all these things for purpose. He made it out of love for humans, for Adam. So in a way it was a, I won't say necessarily an experiment, but you learn sometimes by doing it. And Adam, by doing these things, was learning more about creation and how God did it. What lessons can we learn from eating? The good things. What? I hope. Go ahead. Yes. Lots and lots of things to learn from the experience of creation. And the marriage between Adam and Eve, one man and one woman, that was another lesson that God was trying to teach. Yeah. And, you know, the nature is still God's classroom. That studying nature and being out in nature and thinking about the wisdom of God and love of God to create these things for us should draw us closer to God. It's not just an accident that we have all these wonderful things. God did it on purpose for us. When you think of, you know, you know, in Sabbath school, Lord Division teachers, you know, the cradle rule of kindergarten, primary, and those classes, what do teachers do to their rooms? Decorate. Decorate. Why? Because it gets the kids' it's attention. That's their attention? Okay. And that is why God decorated the garden of Eden to catch Adam's attention. Yeah. And a lot of times the stuff on the wall tell a story. The decorations tell a story to remind people, you know, of that particular Bible story or truth in the Bible. And I think God did that in Eden. You know, he decorated that garden just for help Adam and Eve learn that it, what the uh, he and creation is all about. Because, you know, God was an instructor of the garden, you know, and he was an instructor of the human family. He wanted us to be, he wanted us to be obedient to him. You know, God he instruct us. And as he instructs Adam and Eve in the garden, not to eat up the food, they were to take care of the garden. Because you know these in the days, we are using community and, 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 and speaking to them, you know, and, and share with them, you know, because he was their teacher. Yeah. And think about, you know, what was God teaching them in the garden? He was teaching them to, he was teaching them to be obedient, you know, and, and teaching them the word, you know, the Holy Spirit guide their minds, you want their minds to be guided. I think a lot of part, you know, I think he's teaching them about himself. I think he's teaching them how much God loves them. Um, that there's no reason for them to fear God or question God because he's teaching them all about everything about him, about what he did. But, you know, in that time, they, they, they was very obedient until the enemy stepped in. Because into the last moment, they, they were come to witness to them and let them know that the enemy has break away. You know? So they are to be careful and remember what God has told them. And, you know, yes, God said, don't eat that tree. But you, you think back to they were innocent. They didn't know about the evil. They didn't know about evil. They probably didn't really understand disobedience. 
Because all they were taught was God and God's love. And God's done all these things for you. And just as it says, don't do this one thing. And so I think God is teaching them all about him, all about his love. Because um, they had no knowledge what evil was like. So, no, so no understanding of evil. <laughs> so this is just a vice versa. Fair in wrong. This is why God wants us to know about him and not about the other things of the world. The false, the false teaching, the false doctrine, and all those things that is coming up. But you know, if we just understand and accept, humble ourselves and pray and ask Him to instruct and you know, to straighten our minds, then the things that is coming up before us, you know, we would not worry about it because we know He is a strong God before us. Yeah, I, and I think that's a good point that, you know, if we focus on God and God's love and what He can do for us, what He wants to do for us, and we surrender to that love, we don't need to, we shouldn't be enticed by the world to go the way of the world. Because uh, I think that's Satan's trap, is to get so wound up in the world with things that we, uh, we get taken away from looking at God. And I think in the evening, you know, you may say that they didn't know evil yet. And all they knew was God and his love. And so it was, it was a perfect world, a perfect garden, a perfect teacher. And yet, yeah. You know, I was reading the great controversy. It was 31, chapter 31. I believe it's school 15. And the enemy, when you read that part here, the enemy is telling us that, you know, it reads as energy White is telling us that when we are about to do something good for the Lord, even the pastors and the leaders, when they are about to do something good for the Lord, to bring a good message, the enemy always commits something to distract and disturb and whatsoever you should put before you, the children of God, you, you turn away from you because the enemy come as a singer and distract you. So this is where God, this is where Adam and Eve were in the garden. And while Christ was there, he struck in them and telling them for they not to eat of the food of the garden. And this is where the enemy come in and distract Eve. You know? So this is what we have to do. We have to look at Christ as our personal savior, not to take our eyes off him. Because the moment we take off our eyes off him, the enemy is right at our fear to snatch us. Yeah, just like Peter walking on the water, just once that's right. eyes on Christ, he's okay. And he took it off him. But elsewhere, he started singing. But chapter 3 in Genesis starts out different, you know, it says there in verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. What kind of tone? Yes. You were saying they had a perfect garden, perfect everything. They had perfect evil too. Perfect evil was there, but it had not touched them. But it was there. It's there. And they did, it did happen. So, I mean, if we forget, there's God, there's two energies. There's good and there's evil. And evil is always there, too. We always think about God, but evil powers around, too. But they did not know evil. They didn't know. They didn't know God, either. Well, I think they knew God, because he was there talking to him all the time. And I think most of his discussion was, was talking about who he was, trying to show, show them and demonstrate to them who he was, that he was a God of love. But, you know, I yes, he told them, don't eat that tree. And they were warned that there's an evil thing out there. Beware of that evil thing. But I think most of the instruction was to understand who God is, because that's how Satan is defeated if we focus on God. 
I, I don't think that people think, you know, I think it was instant from the time that God created them that they fell. We don't know how many years that they were in the garden of God before Satan tempted Eve. Yeah, I mean, it know. wasn't just instantaneously. I mean, there were maybe years and years know, that she yeah. was in there. I, I think there's some time between creation and the fall. How yeah. much we don't know. But I think there's enough time there that God was teaching them, was talking about meeting with them, that they had a pretty good idea of who God was. Right. Okay. And they were warned about the evil too. You know what you know what comes to my mind? Where did God keep keep and the enemy out of the garden? When he came into the garden, into the end, into the end, and he wanted to live war here, and God kicked him out and he came down to earth. That is when he went into the garden of Eden. Because he wanted to get back to God. Yeah. You know? And because he wanted to get back to God, he stepped into the garden of Eden. Because he knew if he could have kept Adam and Eve, then he can get the birth. You understand me? Yeah, I think so this is, this is where he comes. That is how he comes into the garden. Yeah, I think in the... Uh The Patriarchs and Prophets, they talk about that, how yeah. Satan was not, did not have total freedom over all the earth. That's right. He was sort of constrained to that tree. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the question is raised, you know, right next to the tree of knowledge and evil was the tree of life. That's right. And why was it put so close to the tree of life? You know, my thought is, you look at the two trees, you got choices. Tree of life, tree of knowledge of evil that goes to death. And just like when the Israelites went into the promised land, they have, you know, the two mountains. Those mountains of blessings and mountains of curses. And people had a choice. They look at those two trees, they have a choice. Tree of life or this other tree. I think God put their, my thought is on purpose, to say, it's right in front of you. Choose what you want. That is why he go to the tree of evil. You know, he did not go to the tree of life. He go to the trees of evil. Because yeah. he told Eve, the, the, the moment that you eat of that fruit, you can be wise as God. You know? So, so that is why he go there. Chapter 3, the first two chapters of Genesis were all about good things happening. But chapter 3 is changes, the cunning of the serpent. If the serpent is cunning, how do the first two chapters of Genesis portray God? As loving. As loving? Wise. Wise? Did he hide stuff from Adam and Eve? God didn't he was open. You know, he explained to him, you know, what all this was about. He explained to him that there's an evil out there. He explained to him that that one tree you stay away from. Uh, don't touch it, don't eat it. And so where Satan is coming, God is up front. He's open. He explains the things to him. Let's read on. Last part of verse 1. This is Satan, the serpent talking. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did he really say you couldn't eat any tree? Moment to eat up with the shy guy. He said, You shall not. What did, because Satan said, Did God say you can't eat any tree in the garden? That's what God said. Not even close. God said, You can eat of all the trees in the garden, but one. But that she should not have a And Satan, you know, went to the extreme saying, Did God say you can't eat any tree? No, it's just. One tree, God said. So he's using extremes here. And sometimes 
when people go to extremes, they are really going out. But you know what you say that it's for the same scripture that God's for for but you turn it around. You know? If you Almost, know. yeah. God said, you yes. eat all the trees, yes. but one. You know, he when said, you can't eat it. Yes, when he was speaking to Eve, he caught the same scripture, but he turned it around. In verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and that you must not touch it, or you will die. Is that what God said? To the one in the midst of the garden. You know, he said to the one said unto him and to the serpent, We may eat of all of the food of the trees of the garden, but the food, the food of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, He shall not eat, neither, neither shall he touch it, lest he die. But that is not quite what God said. You know, it had to be awful baffling to Eve to have a serpent or whatever it was out of the blue to take the meaning of God and then have this talk to her what it had to be. Well, there's some thought that, you know, the serpent ate the fruit of the tree, now he can speak. So maybe that showed proof that it was a wonderful thing. But Eve did not quote God. God said, when you eat a fruit, you will surely die. She didn't say surely die. Is that important or not important? Yes, because the minute that they touched the tree, the death sentence was pronounced. Because that's what God said. God's word doesn't change. But, you know, the fact that God said, you will surely die, and Eve did not say, you will, we will surely die. She said, you'll die. And the you know, author thinks that by not saying that we're surely die, not quoting scripture exactly, maybe showed that she was maybe not paying attention real close. Because look what certain says right then, after that. You will certainly not die. Now, God said you will certainly die. Eve just says you will die. Satan goes back to grab the word that God has said and says, no, that word certainly that God said, no, that's not true. Eve left that out. Satan grabs that thing she left out and uses it to push back to her saying, you will not certainly the, die. That was the first lie ever told For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. What part of that phrase is true? Or any of it true? Did God know their eyes would be opened? Yes. Yeah. How do you know that? What would you see? Because the light of Christ will cover them. They didn't have that light surrounding them from the, with the Holy Spirit. You know, so they were, they did not even know that they were naked. Yeah, they didn't know. They were covered they with see. the light of Christ. Yeah, they, because, they, they he saw. That, because he know that they were covered with the light of Christ. He commanded the moment to eat of it, your eyes shall be open. You know, and you shall be wise like God. And that is where they, they, they run when they eat and find that they were naked. Then they turn around and pick feet and so leave and put on and cover themselves. Say so goes on and say, and you will be like God. True or false? False. Nobody's like God. 
We'll go back to Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, Let's make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So in some ways, they were already like God. But God said, Let's make man in our likeness, in our image. So in one regard, they were already somewhat like God. Well, he made them so that he could commune with them. Yeah. So they had to be able to understand, you know, what, what was being talked about. Well, but he made it sound like there was something more they're lacking. Well, see, it's, um, the devil isn't telling them that they will become God. He's saying that you will be like God and that you will know good from evil. He's saying that there's a particular aspect that you don't have that God has that you will get by eating this fruit. Yeah. But they're lacking something. Yeah. Even though they're created in God's likeness, and his enemies are created, he's saying, but, you know, it'd be more like him if you do this. Knowing good and evil. Is that a true statement? Yes. Yes. It's a true statement. Once they get the proof, they knew about evil, unfortunately, for all of us. And so, again, Satan mixes truth and lies and twists things that it makes it sound good, but yet a little bit of lie means the whole thing is a lie. So that is why you have to study, you have to study to show yourself a proof of because when the false teacher comes, if you do not study the word of God, then you will be deceived, just like he. Yeah. And that's why it's important to know the scriptures. That's right. Yeah. Because when the deception comes, it'll be so subtle that unless you know the scriptures really well, you can be deceived. Because, boy, it sounds like it. It sounds good, but it's not quite true. Sometimes it only takes one little word with two letters to change yeah. the meaning of the whole thing. Did Eve misunderstand God? I don't think so. I think she did. I mean, I don't think she misunderstood what he said. He she was only deceived. She was going to be deceived by the family. Yeah. She was Yeah, she was deceived by the family. Did she flunk the class? But to me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess so. Yeah. You got the perfect class for the first teacher, and she, she still flunked. So, she yeah, she that, they did find that place. She failed that exam. She failed that exam. She did that, that this right. It, it's a mystery to us, I think, to fathom being created in a perfect world, in a perfect situation, in the garden, talk to God, Face to face, and then fail. And, 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 Adam, and Adam did not deceive him because Adam knows the truth. But what Adam was looking looking at, he was looking at his rib. He was looking at the rib that come from him that made Steve. You know, because he could have said, No, God said he should not eat that it. But because of his love for Eve, knowing that he was coming from his rib. That is why he, he let he, the both of them was deceived. Because, you know, when God first God has to know what was going to happen because he knows all. Yeah. So he had to know that Eve was going to fall, that she was going to listen to the serpent. So why go ahead and do it? Yeah, why? <laughs> but God made provision for that. But still, I think of all the terrible things that goes on in the world over our history, you know. You know, when, you know, when I look at this lesson here, this is to teach us a lesson. You know, because we have to be obedient. The moment we are not obedient to God, then we will be deceived, just like you. You know, we have to be obedient. Well, I, I think 
We take, take Adam, for example. When Adam walked onto the scene, I suppose they lived there when she first had this conversation. We walked into the scene and saw what happened. And like you say, he chose. He knew. He knew what happened. He knew what the result was. And yet, he chose to go with Eve rather than with God. Why? No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> he was deceived. Yeah. Adam was not deceived. He made a conscious decision. Yes, he made that choice. He made a choice. Yes, he made that choice. That's the thing he made. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yes, he have a free will choice. Not but why? Why? Because why? he loved to eat more than yes, he Because God. of the rib. Right. Because of the rib here. And no, no he, <laughs> he loved eat more than God. That's right. And. If we love anything more than God, we're going to fall. Amen. Um, he didn't trust God, but he, he loved Eve more than he loved God. Anything that's like that we love more than God, we're, we're, we're in big trouble. Um, and he talked about his wife, you know, his companion, that after he ate all the animals and realized there's no one for him, and God made Eve for him, that was special. And so, our children, you know, we love our children more than God. You know, Jesus says, if, if you don't hate your, your parents compared to me, and he's being hyperbolic here, he's being, uh, make a big show of it, but it says, if you love anybody more than love me, you can't be my disciple. And it's the love that promotes obedience. Without that love, we can't be obedient to God. Yes, obedience is crucial, but without that love, we can't be obedient. And you have to have that love in order to do what you're saying. Um, otherwise, we're just trying to work ourselves, whether we're fooling ourselves, think that we can do these good things and not love God. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'll do, to be used that way. You know what, what the good book says here? That the good news that is because, is, is the good news is that because of Jesus, that on the plan of redemption, all is not lost. We have hope of salvation and of restoration and much of Christian education should be pointing to stu pointing students toward Jesus and what he has done for us and the restoration that he offers. So although Adam and Eve has lost the Garden of Eden, there is hope for us because Christ still come back around and take care of Adam and Eve. Yeah, God gives us that hope. And you know, our faith in Jesus is what saves us. The faith that He died for us. But the thing that we we have to learn is we can only save ourselves. We cannot save our me or our children. Right. We can only save ourselves. We can pray for them. Yes. But we can't, we can't save. save. Although you look at uh, Noah. Why was this? Children say, this one turned out not so good. Joe prayed for it, and Noah both prayed for their children. Okay. And Lot's daughters, you know, because they went with the flowers, they had a chance to see. After the fall, what happened to the classroom? Someone um, has to put Gabriel in jail here to protect the oh, island. Yeah. Because the class was, the school was messed up. So he has to put somebody there to take care of that classroom because he does not want the enemy to get inside there and destroy the rest of the children that were there. I think it was locked out of the Yeah, they kicked down the classroom. Um, and it was guarded, but later on they took it, got to the way, it told it from the roof. So the classroom changed. The lessons change. No. 
The list was what? Right here. It was the same listing, but it's only for that difference. Because the, the, the end, the structure stand up now. He would never let nobody else step inside the inside him. You know, because he, because he know that he did have some wonderful children here, or being their children. But when they disobey, he take over. I was thinking, my opinion, the lesson changed a little bit. And even God was there face to face, explaining who he was, and love, and creation. After Paul and took God Garden of Eden, I think the lesson changed to what is the plan of redemption? How do we restore that relationship with God as opposed to God? The focus then was just on being with God. Now that relationship is broken. And I think lesson after the evening is saying, what's the plan to get this relationship fixed? And that's a plan of redemption. Now that we have to go into prayer and fasting, you know, that is where we have to go now in prayer and fasting to renew that, to renew that restoration to Christ once more. Because that's what Adam and Eve had to do now. You know, because they come to the different hands. And the only thing they can do now is go back to the restoration, go back in fasting and prayer, and ask for pardon and forgiveness. And that's where they get it, you know? But they are still wrong because they disobey. Let's go to the first Peter, or second Peter. Second Peter chapter one. And he talked about the you know is God still trying to teach us? Yes, every day. Is it easier today than in the evening? No. It's not easier today. It's harder? For, you mean for us? us? Yeah. Well, if we love God, it's not hard. If we love God. First, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life, for the knowledge of Him, who calls by His own glory and goodness. He has given us everything we need. We're not lacking anything. So do we have any excuse? We don't have a choice. We can't, we can't say, well, Adam and Eve had it easier. Because here in 2 Peter, it says, God has given us everything we need. Everything. We have no excuse. In the verse 4, I will notice what chapter 11 says. It says, we are as, we are as angels which are greater in power and mighty, bring that reigning accusing, accusation against them before the Lord. In verse 4, through these he has given us a very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by the evil desires. Great and precious promises he has given us. We can't forget those promises. But we have to accept those promises. We have to know them and accept them. Yeah. Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. How do we get those? How do we get those qualities that we're talking about? By studying and understanding the Bible and God's Word. Putting our trust in that Word. Uh, and that's part of where Adam fell. He didn't have a trust in God, you know, that it would, whatever the results of Eve's deception would be. So 
that love back. Uh, a lack of trust, a lack of faith. Yeah, not seeing the end, you know, and, uh, and therefore that is to trust that God is in the And look at, uh, you know, Abraham and Isaac, you know, and God told him to sacrifice them. Abraham trusted God that whatever happened, God would fix it. And here, uh, Adam had a lack of trust that God could fix where it happened. That yes, she may die, but somehow, don't know, but somehow God would made it up. This says to your faith, and I think everything starts with faith. We don't have faith, we can't have goodness, we can't have self-control, we can't have love. Verse 8. <clears throat> For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean by being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge? Can we have knowledge of Christ and be unproductive? Can we have faith and be ineffective and unproductive? Ooh. That's a little tougher one. Can we have faith and yet not be productive? What do you mean by being productive? Bringing others to Christ. We're bringing others to Christ? Living a godly life? Not be unproductive? Yeah. Love yeah. And love is listed last in that whole list. You know, build on, build on, and then you get love. And, you know, without that, we are uh, going to be lost. Real quick, I've well, got a few minutes left. There in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. But there will be also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly induce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bring swift destruction on themselves. False teachers and false prophets. Verse 4 says, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Do not spare the ancient world when you brought the flood on ungodly people for protecting Noah. Goes down and talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and rescued him. So when you look at all those things, there's a promise that even though the world gets bad, there's still hope to protect his own. There in verse 10. This is especially true of those who follow corrupt desires of the flesh and despise authorities. How do you despise authority? Do we despise authority? How do we despise authority? Parents didn't put their butts in that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't want to go there. <laughs> I remember a belt now and then. There, uh, turn back to Hebrews chapter 13, real quick, verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday and today and forever. So keep your leaders in your prayers. Don't despise your leaders. Well, it's time to close, and we're going to have a mission spotlight today, so uh, in the prayer and we'll get into that. Let's pray. Our Lord, Heavenly Father, as we close this lesson study, 
We want to thank you for your word and the lessons you've given us. We thank you for being our teacher. And we pray, Lord, that you be patient with us and help us learn the truth of you. That our love may overflow to other people. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.